Might be a little loose. Maybe it'll be a little, a little bit easier to hear me. All right, everybody. We back to like we said. We're gonna do the Sunday school lesson online so that we don't get behind and everybody still sees what's going on with the Sunday school. So uh, today's gonna be lesson number seven. It's October the eighteenth. Um, just do want to remind everybody we are planning on as long as everything goes as planned. We'll start services back up full swing with everything on uh, Sunday, November the 1st. I just want to put that out there. So keep planning on that. Sunday, November the 1st, we're going to keep doing right back Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night services as of right now. That is the plan. Um, just keep praying for everyone. Um, I kind of felt a little foolish. I just got up Sunday night last week and thanked everybody for doing so good and everything was doing great. We really hadn't had any kind of problems with COVID-19 and then the very next day, everything kind of blew up on us. But anyway, um, and I'm going to throw out, I may go kind of fast and I hope it doesn't and I'm wasting time now. I guess you could see some people could say, but. Um, we're recording this on Sister Sheena's phone. She's getting a lot of phone calls right now. A lot of stuff's going on. I think it's supposed to be plugged up to a charger right now. Give me just a second here. She told me that it was about to die. Hope that doesn't stop the video. But uh, she's getting a lot of phone calls. And she, she, you know, things, people checking on Brother A, Sister Christie, everybody. So we're going to try to go through this kind of quick. It's easier for the video to upload if it's shorter. It's better on the phone memory. So I'm going to try to keep it short as I can. So we're going to dive right into this with the Pentecostal Publishing House Living Word Series, Fall 2020, The Purpose and Plan of God. The title of today's lesson is that God's Word is Good for Us. And our focus thought is that if we are to please God, we must listen to and honor God's word. Our focus verse is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The lesson text picks right up that same verse. We're going to go ahead and do verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You know, I preached a message here a while back and I used that lesson text, you know, that the man of God may be perfect. And a lot of people throw that out there. Well, nobody's perfect. You know, this, we're supposed to be trying to be. We should be striving for perfection. And the word of God is the only way that we would ever have that opportunity or even have the chance of coming close to hitting the mark. Continuing the lesson text in Luke chapter 11, verse 28, it says, But he said, yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was, was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold a greater than Jonas is here now in our culture in the culture connection it talks about how NASA I'm going to start just start reading it as I make sure this is still recording NASA did all their research crunched all their numbers and sent Mars rover Curiosity into outer space in 2012. You may remember this. Engineers, scientists, and a team of other intellectuals 
watched as the spacecraft carrying the rover climbed out of the Earth's atmosphere on its 352 million mile journey. That is a long way. The trip would take just over eight months to complete. Two-thirds of a year later, the spacecraft was about to enter the Martian atmosphere and prepare for landing. But after all those many miles and all those many months, it was estimated to be 13 miles off course. The team at NASA went right to work and made a minor course correction. Very minor. So minor, only one centimeter per second. That seemingly minor course correction set the craft to land where the engineers targeted to land to begin with. Course correction is one of the blessings of the Word of God. As we walk with God, we may find ourselves veering off course from time to time. We may not be praying as often as we should, but we read, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. It's Ephesians 6, 18, and yes, that was the New King James Version uh, translation. Perhaps we are having a difficult time tempering our temper, but we read Ephesians 4, 26. Be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Again, that is New King James Version translation. God's word is perfect for course corrections. The next time you are not where you need to be, God's word will show you where you need to be and how to get there. Now this next thing, we're going to read an excerpt from George Barna's 2019 State of the Bible Report. I'm going to throw, you know, I like how these, has been, these have been updated. We're not reading text and things and studies that were done in the 1970s and 80s. That says 2019. So a year ago, George Barna, he did a state of the Bible report, and he found some things that we may find alarming. He found that 5% of the population, of our population in the United States, not the world, this is just in the United States, 5% of the population are Bible-centered, meaning they interact with the Bible frequently, and it is transforming their relationships and shaping their choices. 19%, it you know, sounds like we're getting better, you know, 5%, no, 19. So 5% of people are using it for what it's intended. Their life is centered around it. 19% are Bible engaged, meaning the Bible is transforming their relationship with God and with others. But that's kind of all that they're doing with it, you know. So, you know, Bible, it is transforming their relationship with God and others. Then there is another 19% who are he, what he called Bible friendly. These people interact with the Bible on a consistent basis, and it may be a source of spiritual insight and wisdom to them, but to them that's kind of what it is. His study also found that 9% are Bible neutral, meaning they interact with the Bible sporadically and it has little spiritual influence in their lives, although that influence may be growing, so you know that 9% may grow into one of these other percent brackets somewhere down the line, you know, there's that possibility. But the scary thing is that 48% 48%, almost half, of America's population are Bible disengaged. Interacting infrequently with the Bible, they believe that it has minimal, if any, stock or you know, proof or truth in it, and it has very little impact in their lives. So, you look at the where the world is today, you look at this statistic, you kind of see how you can make sense, and I know I'm probably walking out of the frame like crazy, but almost half of our population are Bible 
disengaged. 9% are Bible neutral. Oh, it's there. There's some good stuff in it. Uh, but I just don't feel like it's really important to me. 19% are Bible friendly. I could kind of put those people in my mindset as those that could probably carry a conversation about the Bible. You know, it's a source of insight. They may go to it every once in a while if they're having a problem. The other 19% of people who are Bible engaged, you know, it's mostly transformative. They're using it for a piece of what it's used for, but they don't have the full grasp of it. And then only 5% are the Bible centered. It is their life. It's what they build their life on. And it's what the lesson is going to stress the rest of this today. I would say morning, but I have drug around. It's almost 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But this lesson is really going to get into detail in how important it is that that's not a good number to be the centered. Unless I read this lesson backwards and hopefully you have your lesson book with you all right we're going to start breaking down the scripture we just read a while ago all right all scripture is profitable okay value value there's an old saying that says one man's trash is another man's treasure so value is a relative term you know what i may consider to have very little value or what I consider to might be the most valuable thing that I own might not do you any good. You have no desire for or, or vice versa, one way or the other. Um, your prized possession, I might think, well, yeah, that's nice. My prized possession, you may have no idea of why I think it's so great. So it's just kind of based on what we, our perception on the value of an item is totally on just our perception. But we're going to talk about how our perception, or even is our perception of God's Word, is what's so important. Yes, it's, it's, it's the Word of God. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not taking away from it. We're just trying to point a, a light at the fact that we have to have our perception. Where do you rank God's Word? Where does you in your mind, where do you put it? How high on the total pole do you put the Word of God? Because people value the Word of God differently. For some individuals that maybe haven't had too much of an experience with it, haven't been woken up in the middle of the night with some random Bible verse in their mind, so they, they grab their Bible out of the nightstand, or maybe they, they get up and hunt through the house to find their Bible, they open up that Scripture, and that Scripture be something that they needed to hear in that time of their life that they were in. Those people, it's going to be kind of hard to tell them, well, yes, there's nothing to it, or there's not as much to it. Everything is got, it's, it, the Bible doesn't have a back and forth, but people's perception of God's Word has a back and forth. 2 Timothy 3 and 16 said that all Scripture, and that's the part we're looking at right now, is given by inspiration of God. Sorry, that should be big G, but, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. For instruction in righteousness. So let's go into the doctrine part of that. That's the next part. All right. Paul told Timothy that the word is profitable for doctrine. If our doctrine is not right, nothing else matters because nothing else is going to be right. Doctrine is what you stand on. Doctrine is where your faith is. It's where you are. It's where the word of God comes from. It's where the life we're supposed to be for, for perfection that striving perfection that we're supposed to be trying to achieve is only going to be there if your doctrine is right. All right? There are two foundations of all biblical theology. Deuteronomy 6 and 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There's your oneness. Okay? I'm going to say there's half. Okay? There's half of it. The other half, Leviticus 11 and 44. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. There's the plan of salvation. Those two meet, they make a whole. There is our doctrine. If it deviates anywhere from these two points, 
one Lord. Sanctifying yourself. Something's not right. You're off the bubble. You're, you're just like the rover was on its way to Mars. They realized it was going to be several miles off course. They had to recalibrate. They had to redo some things. And they was able to achieve what they were after because they were willing to admit they must have gotten something wrong while that machine was still on the ground and that very slight one centimeter a second adjustment was made but all right, you still can't knock them people too much and it was it eight months 352 miles and they only missed it by 13 miles I mean come on but the Bible is also so if your doctrine is right that's what, and the Word of God keeps your doctrine in check. It's where you get it from. You get it from the Word of God. It's for reproof. The same Word that leads us to bring right in doctrine will also keep us right in our daily lives. Brought you out of sin, it's going to keep you out of sin. It's going to keep you every day. Now, Hebrews 4 and 12 says that for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So think of how that... Think of that for just a minute, that last part, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God, you know, and God Himself has the power, the Word has the power to discern our very thoughts and our intents. Now, one thing that's going to go into the next thing, through this reproof, you know, brings you out of sin. You got convicted. You felt something wasn't right, okay? That's great. That's what God wants. God wants us to have a strong sense of conviction when it is necessary. And it can lead, and the way you find it, well, it's because the Word of God it discerns our very thoughts and our intents. You may not have told anybody else about it. You may think everything's hid. You may think you have had, you've gotten everybody fooled. But the bottom line is, is God and His Word, and even when you begin to read that Bible and you begin to maybe try to study things out, things that you thought never said no one else, you may see in Scripture, should have never even been entertained. So, now, thoughts enter our mind, the devil wars in different ways in people's minds and in our thoughts. Like Brother Ray always says, it's not bad that a bird lands on your head, but that doesn't mean you're going to let it stay and build a nest and just move in on you. You're going to try to shoo him away so that you can carry on with your life. You don't want that thing to hinder you. Same way with thoughts that shouldn't be there. It's not bad that the thought necessarily arrived, but did the thought get entertained? Did it get a second thought, or did it get an instant a, a correction that takes us into our next spot because without the conviction the correction or sometimes it can go back and forth you feel the conviction shh, you end it you take care of it you you stop that just quick correction never has to come but having conviction without direction leads to frustration and that's where a lot of church people find themselves at today they've got the conviction but they don't have a lead to showing them of where they need to turn to from that point that they're in now, and it leads to the frustration. I feel like a weatherman now pointing at the thing. It leads to frustration, which ultimately leads with them stepping back out of the church again. And that's not what we want to see in the church. Hebrews 12 and 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he's correcting you, it's because he loves. Okay? Imagine raising your child with rules and guidelines, but doing nothing to correct them when the child disobeys. So what good do the rules and the guidelines do if there's nothing to correct them? Without correction, 
human nature tends to always follow after its own self-will. That's why God corrects, corrects us. Get you out of your self-will and after the will of God. Not our will, but thy will. Hebrews 12 and 6. If he loves you, he's going to chastise you. He's going to convict you. But he's going to give you direction, whether out of his word or whether through it someone teaching or leading or preaching or however it's going to be, there'll be a leader somewhere in the church that you will see and that they're not necessarily going to always know that you needed it. So how many times have you ever sat on a church pew and listened to a preacher preach and they begin to touch on something that you're going through that you haven't told anyone about? And you left that service feeling all right. I, God knows where I am. God knows he's been hearing my prayers. I, I'm okay. I'm not okay right here where I am, but I know where to go to next. It's because God loved you enough to send you that word. I always be looking for that word. The word correction, the way the lesson uh, brings it out today, it comes from the Greek word meaning to restore to its proper condition to make straight. This is the goal of correction. The goal is to bring the individual to a better state. God's correction is meant to bring you to a better place. Correction in your children, you're correcting them to try to make them a better person. The same love of God that motivates the word to convict is the same love that brings correction into our life. God is not some evil tyrant waiting to inflict pain onto our lives the moment we disobey. Rather, He is loving and a merciful Father who will bring correction to us if we do not respond to correction. Conviction, excuse me. See, I messed it up. God don't. The same love that convicts the heart is the same love that brings correction. I got it right that time. Instruction in righteousness. Okay? We already laid the groundwork for doctrine. Okay? Well, the ultimate goal of doctrine, conviction, and reproof is that we might be in a right relationship with God. Not just a relationship with God, not one of those, those other 19 percenters a while ago or any of those other ones. That very first statistic, wasn't it 5%? I can't even remember now. But that very first one, 5%, the right relationship, that's what we're after. And that's what these three things can bring. The grace of God that brought salvation to us becomes our teacher and teaches us righteousness through the Word of God. So just getting into that Word, we, we just... It does so much for us. The only way that we know righteous is to be taught. There's only one way. It is to be taught. If we're ever into a frame of mind thinking that we know it all and we have no reason to be taught anymore, that's a dangerous frame of mind to be in. The only way we know righteous is to be taught. Yes, the Word of God is there. It's His living Word. There's His scriptures. There's Everything we just talked about, there's the reproof, there's correction, there's everything there for the perfection of the saints. But hearing it, I know a lot of people have the mindset of they have things in their life that they taught themselves. I didn't have nobody teach me how to do anything. I had to learn it all myself. That may be true. You may have taught yourself to cook. You may have taught yourself to play some kind of instrument. But even with that, you had to go with something, especially with the instrument. You needed a piece of paper or something with the chords, whether it's a piano, a guitar, or whatever that it might be. You had to get it from somewhere. Even if you got it off of the internet, you had to go somewhere. You might have been self-taught, but you were still taught. Talking about this and looking into righteousness and the right relationship with God is something that has to be taught. That's the only way that it's going to come. Devotion to God should be seen by the world 
in all that we do. And that's how it got talked to us. We saw the devotion to God coming through someone else's life in every aspect, every avenue, every window, everything that they did. You just saw God's face just radiating out of it. And that's how it was taught to you. That's how it was taught to me. We just continue that same pattern for the one coming next and can see it through us. Our lives are proof that God's word is profitable. We all can attest to that. Living godly means to take on a devout lifestyle. Our devotion to God is seen by the world around us in all that we do. Our lives become proof that the word of God is profitable to us and is helping us to become more like him every day. Again, there's that striving for perfection every day. All right, we must hear and keep God's word. So hear and keep the word of God. All right, there's no deception worse than self-deception. Each one of us has a personal responsibility for the effect that the Word of God has in our own lives. Okay? I cannot rely on someone else's opinion on the Word. That's just that's the bottom line. I can't depend on what you say or he says or she says. I've got to make it personal to me to let God's Word shape me and mold me. You have got to make the personal thought, the conscious decision, because you can't rely on what I say or what I think the Word of God. You can't rely on the words that I'm saying this morning about this lesson. You have to say, I'm going to let the Word of God shape and mold my life for that right relationship with God and that I can make it personal to me every day in my life that I can do this for God. If you don't make that decision, if you deceive yourself into thinking anything other, anything else, any other doctrine, any other thing, you're self-deceived and you, it's a slippery slope. Because it's one thing to have other people deceive us, but when we begin to deceive ourselves, we're in danger of living by whatever pleases us. It just it kind of, well, this makes me happy, that makes me happy, well, I can do this, or... Or I know, but I like this idea over here better, so I'm going to run over here with what this group says or what this person said. Even though it goes against the word, I still like it better because it, you know, church doctrines and different things, teaching what the crowd wants to hear because they don't want their numbers to leave because if, Tithes quit coming in and the money slows down. Pastor may not get the salary he's been getting paid and different things like that. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that. I'm just saying what is the leading cause of the doctrine coming out of the church? Is it what we're talking about today for the perfection of the saints? Is there scripture being taught? Is there correction being taught? Not as a somebody browbeating over the top of people's heads, but in a, okay, here is the word, here is what it says. You do what you feel you need to do with it. You have to do this for yourselves, or you can be deceived. All right, James 1 and 22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Once we deceive ourselves, we're open to further deception. Then you get that self, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of repeating again, you get that self-deceiving thing going, then other voices begin to deceive, and we can no longer hear the clear word of God. Um, when, uh, when me and Samantha went hunting yesterday evening and we got in our deer stand and I should have done, I should have looked up above into the tree before we ever climbed in it. But we were already sitting in the stand and everything was sort of settling down. We had got everything put in there the way we wanted it. We had snacks and water and different stuff like that. Well, I finally look up above our head and noticed that the tree next to it had died, 
fallen and was leaning on the tree that we were sitting in, and if it was to fall, it was no other way it would go would be right on top of us. So, you know, we quickly got out, and we walked over to about 20 yards away, we sat down on the ground and got some real leafy limbs and stuff and just kind of tucked them and put them off all the way around us, trying to still hide the best that we could. And in my mind, honestly, I was thinking, well, that pretty much goes any chances of us maybe seeing anything. But by the end of the night, we had had deer everywhere, including one do a doe had gotten like really close to us. I mean, it was just unreal. Samantha had a ball. She had never seen a deer that close before in the wild or anything like that. But one thing that stuck out to me, or I had a thought of, and it plugs in with this point right here. Every one of those, the deer that we saw, it did not take them very long to realize something's different right there. Something's there that wasn't there before. Something's not right. I mean, and it was, it was just that quick. There was one doe that walked out, and I mean, we, I, I just happened to turn and look and seen her as she stepped out of the thicket, and when she stepped out of the thicket, our eyes met. She looked straight at us, and I mean, you could tell instantly there was a... Okay, I'm not going any closer because that's not right. Just that alertness to danger, always on such a high, just maxed out, just on edge. That's the level that we as Christians should be at every day. We get too comfortable sometimes around things that are actually meaning to harm us. And the world that we live in today shows that. Okay? I shouldn't even be tolerating this. Or I shouldn't be staying around this. May I shouldn't be quiet because of this. I need to say something. I need to... We've let all these different things and we've, we've, we've tolerated danger for too long. And to be honest with you, last night with a couple of the different ones that we, we saw... Had it not been for the Toombs County rules right now for the doe days, they could have really met a lot more danger than what they thought because there were several times where I could have, I ain't going to say I could have killed them because I'm not that, that into myself. You always have a chance of missing. I could have at least shot at them. And their danger, they were in no danger of us at all. We couldn't do anything but look at them. But they didn't know that. They didn't care about that. All they knew was there's something there that's not been there before. That doesn't look right. I've got to get out of here. If we could get that same frame of mind in our spiritual walk with God, our spirituality, our health, our, well, our, our mental health, our well-being, just everything inside and out, our thought process of what the Word of God means to us, so highly regarded to the point that if someone says anything negative about it, anything bad about it, no, we don't get an argument about God's word, but we just, we know the truth of God's word. We know what it means to us, and we just decide to, you know what, I'm not going around that anymore. But we tend to find ourselves hovering around things that we should. Okay, look at negativity. You can have 10 people in a really good mood, everything going fine, and any, any, any group of people, you throw in one negative person that just, I'm tired of this, I'm tired of these people, I'm tired of that, I'm tired of that, and it doesn't take long between that one becomes two, the two become four, and then before long, all 10 people are all in the same mindset because one come in with a bad, you threw one rotten apple in the box and it rotted all of them. So, being careful about deceiving ourselves. Oh, well, I, that's just man's law. That's it. What have you got yourself deceived in? We have to be careful in what we're saying is and isn't God's word. If it's his word, it's his word. There's nothing we can do about it. We can follow it or we cannot. His scripture even says he would rather us be hot or cold lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Don't want anything to do with it. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. 
All right. Now, when the scriptures that we read a while ago talking about Jonah and when he was preaching, all right, when the, the, the cool thing about when Jonah preached to Nineveh is that Nineveh responded. You know. And as we've already seen, one of the primary purposes of the Word of God is to bring change into our lives. The power of the preached word seeks to bring conviction to the hearts of people that in turn will lead them to repentance. Now as Paul stated in Romans 7 and 9, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Without the word, we living according to we live according to our own conscience. Paul told us that the word brings an awareness of sin. I was trying to talk about a while ago, I don't know if I got it out right, about the deer. That awareness, the awareness of sin, and knowing I don't need to be around that, that's dangerous. I need to get away from that. I need to withdraw. It brings awareness of sin and the realization that we are dying in our sin. Okay? Okay. Without the Word of God, we have no concept of sin or any reason to repent. All right? Luke 11, 29-32, we read it a while ago. All right? We read Jonah preaching to Nineveh and the result of it. So, for time's sake, I'm not going to read it again. We just read it a while ago. But remembering when Jonah's, in the book of Jonah, when he preached to Nineveh, revival swept through. So much it made him mad. He just didn't, he actually did not like the fact that those people responded so well through Nineveh. They responded to the word of God. Now Jesus went on to challenge the crowd that we were reading about a while ago to follow the Nineveh into repentance. Follow their example. Do what they did. And in the scriptures that he was talking about how, you know, they were looking for Solomon, but there's one wiser than him here. They were looking for this, but there's something greater than that here. And he's talking about himself, not in an arrogant way, but just in saying what they need is right here. We see people go through a lot of things in their lives or, or and just or a life they, they won't change, they won't turn. You see God save them from the hands of death over and over again. We see it in our, some of you see it in your children, in your you know, older, older children that have young adults. You see it over and over, but yet there just seems to not be a change. And we, you think in your mind, and we all think it, we all say it when we pray for them, is if, if it's just the Word of God is right there. What they need is right in front of them. You know, I don't know if y'all can see it, you know. It's right here at the altar. It's not went anywhere. But we have to continue our walk, our knowledge of God's Word. And when I say knowledge, I mean like we're talking about this morning, what God's Word is, the real, the, you know, how real it is and how alive it is. Because God's Word inspires faith and it keeps our faith going. Faith is, I love this phrase, faith is a fact. It's not a feeling. Okay, some of those other percents that we gave out a while ago are people that might think, you know, luck or things like that. And it's, it's, no, it's not superstition. It's not, faith is not just hoping for the best. Faith, faith in God is a fact. And that's what we're seeing here. God is all-powerful, whether we feel his power or not, it doesn't matter how we're feeling at the time. What matters is, is that God is still God. He is still on the throne. He is still all powerful. We have our faith in him. Hebrews chapter 11 is filled with works of faith. 11 and 1 says, you know, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Stories of ordinary people who did extraordinary things through their faith. Well, uh, where did that come from? Well, Romans 10 and 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing. Where did it come from? And hearing 
by the Word of God. There's the Word of God. There was somebody teaching it. You heard it, and that's where your faith came from. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. God's Word brings us hope. Have you ever felt hopeless? Yeah. Struggled? You're struggling now? Yeah. You ever felt like the energy just being completely sucked out of you? You feel like you're living under a cloud? Yeah. Do you have to live every day of your life that way? No. Because there is hope in the Word of God. Isaiah 40 and 31, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Psalms 119 and 114 says, Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Now, it's not necessarily when I'm talking about said God's Word right now. I'm not just saying Bible. It's going to come out about some sure. God's Word. God may speak to you in different ways other than His Word. But in any other way that you may think or see that you get a word from God for reproof, go get your Bible and make sure what you're hearing, whatever word you got from wherever you got it from, a song on the radio, a piece of a sermon you heard on the radio, a commercial. God, they can, God can talk to different people in different ways. So don't never say, oh, well, that couldn't have been of God. Now, no, you didn't get a word from God stone blind drunk in a bar. I just, I'm going to draw a line on that one. But, well, then again, if it gets you, if this the last time something happens and God speaks to you, he might speak an audible voice and that's the last time you do that, then okay, maybe it was God. But if you can't back it up with, with the actual Bible, with what we call the Word of God, then it's not, it didn't come from him. He's not going to contradict his own Word. All right, one thing, he brings us hope in everything. He's a hiding place. I hope in thy word. Okay? His word equips us. It gives us everything that we're going to need. Okay? A life pleasing to God is the goal. Pleasing to God is the goal. We'll read that scripture again. Uh, I thought I was. Okay? that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The right relationship with God, a life pleasing to God is the goal. Hebrews 10 and 7, Then I said, here I am, it is written about me in the scrolls, I have come to do your will, my God. Okay, to live a life that's pleasing to God should be the goal for each and every one of us. At the end of our days, we should be able to say, like the writer of Hebrews, then said, I lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. That's Hebrews 10 and 7. Can you imagine having the confidence to know that God has said of you that you delighted to do his will? One of the greatest accolades David received is found in Acts 13 and 36, where it says, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep. This shepherd boy from the hillsides of obscurity became so selfless that he served his own generation by the will of God. This did not just happen overnight or just happen just because at some point. David fell in love. <coughs> That's a first excuse me, he fell in love with the Word of God. <clears throat> the Word is what ordered his steps. All right, when he, Psalms 119, 133. He allowed it to become a lamp for his feet and a light to his past. 119, 105. He hid it in his heart so that sin would not enter into his life. 119 and 11. 
We have to fall in love with God's Word. In closing, God literally sows the seeds of His Word in our lives. They're, I mean, they're unlimited, so why not? Just continuously pour them out on us. Oh, uh, but just like any other seed, it has to be tended so that it can grow. What we do with it, okay, God sends the seed, we have to prep the soil. If our soil's not right, if our doctor's out of whack, like we read a while ago, just like the people trying to get that machine on Mars, 13 miles off, whatever, if we're off the mark, any kind of way, our soil's not going to be right. The seed's not either. Either it's not going to come up at all, or it's not going to come out as strong as it could. Root system not as healthy as it could be. We have to tend the soil. It is ultimately our choice whether we will nurture the seed or refuse to allow it to take root. The word has to be more than a reference or a book. It's not just something that you reference. Well, some of those other percentages while ago we're doing. It's just something that they reference. No, 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 no. The five for sin. It's the center. Your world revolves around it. His word must speak to us, guide us, and give direction to us. Okay? It must do that. That's what it does. How we, res we respond to it is what makes the difference. All right, hope that was okay. I'm showing 50 minutes right here, so it wasn't as short as I was trying to make it. Um, just in case anything went on crazy with the camera or anything happens, just to let everybody know, once again, we are planning on November the 1st, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, going right back to our services like we were doing, Sunday school at 10, Service at 6 that evening on Sunday. Wednesday night services at 7.30. Uh, everybody still be careful when that day comes. Hand sanitizer, mask. If someone doesn't shake your hand, please do not be offended because you might be okay with it after what we just went through. Some of us might not be. Okay? Keep that in mind. Okay, we can't have our feelings too high up on our shoulders right now. You stick your hand out and shake somebody's hand and they look at you and say, I love you or praise the Lord or whatever and they just kind of keep walking. It's not that they're mad with you. It's just we don't know what happened. We don't know where this came from. Um, nobody does when they get it. it. It's hard to ever say, oh, I got it from so-and-so. You don't know. It's, it's, it's just, it's, there's no way of knowing. So, we love y'all. Hope you enjoyed this lesson. We'll keep up. I haven't counted how many Sundays we're going to have to do it this way, but nothing else. We'll do this again next week.